Uh, tonight what we're going to be doing is, is getting into what I would call the nature and background of 2 Corinthians chapters 10 through 13. The nature and background. So it'll be in two parts. The nature of the content of the last four chapters in 2 Corinthians and then the background, the background of Paul's relationship with the Corinthians. Now we are discussing on Wednesday nights in our series on the faith message, a particular passage over in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, where Paul said, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. Then he repeats what he started with in this verse. Some texts have it connected to the end of verse 6, the first part of 7, but it doesn't make any difference. But he repeats it again anyway, lest I should be exalted above measure. That's 2 Corinthians 12, 7. The famous or maybe infamous case of Paul's thorn. It's generally not referred to as Paul's messenger of Satan, by the way. You generally don't hear that very often because that may uh, tend to... Uh, somewhat deflate the denominational theory that God's blessing Paul with some sickness. So you don't ever hear it referred to as the messenger of Satan. But the second phrase, as we'll learn later, is oppositional. A, not O, is oppositional to the first one. They're saying the same thing. Thorn in the flesh equals messenger of Satan. But for whatever reason, and I think I've just given it to you, thorn in the flesh has become the popular of the two. It's so popular that it actually dominates those two phrases to the point that the second one is never even heard of, except maybe in some charismatic circles. And it will involve the question later in this uh, study on Wednesday night as to the source of Paul's whatever. We'll just call it Paul's thing. So we don't have to say one or the other. Was the thorn in the flesh given from God or was the thorn in the flesh a messenger from Satan? Or could we speak of it as coming from both? from one in one sense and from the other in another sense. We'll see about that later. But I want to get into tonight to begin with the nature of the content of the last four chapters of 2 Corinthians. I don't know how much you know about uh, 1 and 2 Corinthians. My guess would be you know more about 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians is real concrete and real specific. It just deals with topics, lawsuits, immorality, marriage, meets offered to idols, spiritual gifts, resurrection, party spirit in Corinth. It deals with real specific things that you can get your teeth sunk into. Second Corinthians isn't exactly like that. Second Corinthians is highly, extremely autobiographical, more so than any of the other epistles that Paul wrote. And for that reason, among others, Second Corinthians is a rather unique book, rather unique epistle of Paul. One thing that all commentators will agree on, regardless of which side of the question of sickness and healing they come down on, that is that no portion of Paul's writings gives as much deep personal information as the last four chapters here in 2 Corinthians. And it isn't so much the factual biographical uh, itinerary type knowledge that you'd get in a place like the book of Acts or in Galatians 1 or in Philippians 3 although that too is included but it's Paul's heart and mind and personality that come out here you may remember in the book of Acts Luke gives a whole lot of information about the Apostle Paul but it's not so much about Paul's feelings Paul's thoughts Paul's heart his mind his spirit his soul his attitude but rather his factual, biographical, itinerary experiences. He went here, he preached this message, the people said this to him, he did this miracle, he was mobbed, and he moved on. And every chapter is like that. It just tells a lot of factual, biographical information about him. Second Corinthians contains a little bit of this uh, factual, biographical type information, this itinerary type information that you would find in Acts and some of his other epistles. But much more than that, you find a revelation of Paul's heart and his mind and his personality. And I'm talking about the last four chapters in particular. This is true to a greater degree of this portion of 2 Corinthians than anything else there. 
All the commentators, regardless of which side of the question they would come down on, would also agree with what I've just said, that first, Second Corinthians chapters 1 through 9 make up one whole section. And whenever you turn to verse 1 of chapter 10, you're into something else that's entirely different. You're into new material. You're into something that doesn't even have the same spirit or tone that the first nine chapters have. They will all agree on that. So these chapters are, are unique and different and unusual and sometimes difficult chapters, 2 Corinthians 10 to 13. And I just feel that it's so important if we're going to properly identify Paul's thorn or if we're going to have a really full and rich and, and vivid and complete and thorough understanding of Paul's thorn, we're going to have to understand something of the context. And I don't mean looking one verse earlier and one verse later of Paul's thorn verse, 2 Corinthians 12, 7, but of really understanding something about the context here of 2 Corinthians. A larger context would be the end of this book here, chapters 10 to 13. Then you're going to have to study the book itself. Then you're going to have to know something about his relationship to the Corinthians. So we're going to be getting into that. In chapter 11, verses 22 through 23, you do have biographical information supplied. Understand what I mean by that, that just Paul says that such and such was my experience. As a matter of fact, really here in 2 Corinthians, although it's in a highly abbreviated fashion, we have much, much more information about Paul's physical sufferings than we have in the book of Acts. And I think maybe that's important to note because a lot is made concerning physical suffering and the alleged relationship of that with Paul's thorn. You actually have in these verses 22 through 33, you're going to get rather familiar over the next few weeks with Corinthians second, first and second, and Paul, and Paul, a lot of different things. We're going to go into a lot of things. My 10 messages on Paul's thorn, you know, grew to 15, and today they grew to 20. I did five more today, and I sincerely hope that I can reduce that 20 to 10 if I can talk quickly enough. It's just a shame on the record and history of the church that we'd have to spend 20 messages just saying that Paul wasn't sick. That's a shame. That is a real shame. If we're going to have to spend, it's not our fault here in this church, but it's a real shame. It's a real sad testimony to the whole institutional system out there. If we would have to spend 20 precious hours of ours, 20 weeks of ours, 20 nights of ours saying that Paul wasn't sick saying that the thorn is what the thorn was, and the thorn isn't what some denominational commentator tries to make it be. It's clear what it is, but maybe we can make it more clear by making it rich and full. I hope we don't have to go 20 weeks on that. I, I don't like to teach messages just for the sake of adding the numbers up, but we will go as long as we need to to finish the information. Back to what I was saying. These verses, 22 through 33 in chapter 11, really give us a lot of biographical information about Paul but it's in a real abbreviated fashion. Luke will give you, a, you know, half a chapter in Acts 19 telling us about the Ephesian riot and how Paul was able to escape that, or a fourth or third of the chapter of um, Acts 16, Acts 16 about Paul's uh, mistreatment at the hands of the Philippians, not the Philippian Christians, but the uh, pagans there. And Paul doesn't give us chapters. He just gives us a couple of references packed together in these verses, especially uh, 23 through 27. And he actually gives us, I would say, more about his own physical sufferings, and there's a reason why he's doing that. We'll understand that later. He actually gives us more than Luke gives us in the book of Acts, half of it, chapters uh, 13 through 28. Let me just mention a couple of things in this list, though we'll be back to this in more detail later. Notice in verse 25, we could pick out several of these, but notice in verse 25, Paul said right in the middle of that, three times I suffered shipwreck. Now you say, well, he must be talking about two in addition to that one that Luke has reference to that took up a whole chapter. 
Acts chapter 27, remember Paul's shipwreck over there? So that would be one of them, and Paul has reference to two more. No, Paul is writing 2 Corinthians before Acts 27 happened. So that's at least four times Paul was shipwrecked, and that only takes us to the end of Acts 27. That doesn't include all the other experiences he had after that. See, you have to know a little bit of what came when. You know, some dates, some, some, some chronology here. And it'll add to your understanding because otherwise you'd probably think, well, Paul is referring to that shipwreck in Acts plus two more. No, he's not referring to that one. That one's in the future. He doesn't know about that one yet. He's had three already, not a hint of it anywhere in the book of Acts. Nowhere are we told that. I mean, by the time Paul's writing 2 Corinthians, we would, we, could have, we would need to do a little study to find out how many times do we know from Acts he's been on a boat anyway. It'd be hard to get him shipwrecked three times. You know, we hear about Paul's three missionary journeys. <laughs> you know, that's, that's according to Acts, though. And you've got to go to some of Paul's other epistles to find out that he did a whole lot of other journeying around. He took a lot of other trips. And then, of course, you just got to go to the secret vault of heaven to find out that there's more that happened than you'll find in either Acts or his epistles. So Paul is giving us the fact that on three different occasions prior to Acts 27, he had already suffered shipwreck. And something else mentioned, like in verse, we could say this with all of these, really, but some of them are more outstanding than others. In verse 24, he said that he was flogged by the Jews, that he was beaten. It was a special manner in which the Jews, with the authority of the synagogue, would beat people. And he said that of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. We'll do a study of that later, what he means by that and, and so forth. Well, what's interesting here is that Luke never mentions a single Jewish flogging anywhere in the book of Acts. So Paul is saying that by the time 2 Corinthians is being written, he has already experienced five of these terrible things, and they killed many men. A Jewish flogging, 39 stripes, 40 save one, 39 stripes with a piece of uh, material that had three um, branches on it, three pieces of, uh, well, it was like leather, sheepskin on it, embedded in that, pieces of metal and stone and bone. And so you'd get 13 of those with three lashes, 13 times three is 39. And it would just lay a man's hide open. And many a time it killed men. And the... I'm getting ahead of myself, but the man who had the authority, who was the ruler of the synagogue, or really the man under him who had the authority to, to um, uh, dispense of these beatings, it was at his discretion whether or not to give the full number for fear of the man's life. In other words, if he felt the man simply could not endure the 39 lashes, they didn't want to kill him. Sometimes they inadvertently did anyway, but they would hold back and maybe give, you know, five of those. Five times three would be 15 lashes in. Maybe give five of those. Paul took the full number allowable under Mosaic law, really under Mosaic law minus one. He took the full number allowable on five occasions and got up and walked away from them all. Sick man, I don't think you're going to make Paul sick. The only one who's sick is the people who try to make Paul sick. You're not going to get that out of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 1, book of Acts. You're not going to get it. It's just not there. And all those verses, they think that, well, Paul didn't recognize one of those people in Acts 23, the leader of the Sanhedrin, so he had weak eyesight, or he wrote with large letters, or he said that he had a thorn in the flesh, or in Galatians 4, 15, he said that if it had been possible, you'd have plucked your eyes out and given them to me. You're not going to be able to make sickness out of any of those passages. And the Bible will be clear on that as we go along. But let's get into tonight, first of all, the content, the nature of the content of these four chapters, just so you'll recognize that they're a little bit unusual, a little bit different. Uh, he's got a certain situation going on at Corinth, and what that is we will start discussing here later on. But because of that, Paul employs all different types of literary devices in these four chapters to score points in his very emotional a passionate plea and response to the Corinthians. He uses such things as rhetorical questions, sarcasm, especially irony, ridicule. It results in compressed thought, 
It results in broken syntax. Just look at the Bible translations of 2 Corinthians 13.2 on that one, and you'll see what I mean. 2 Corinthians 13.2, broken syntax. That verse is difficult, what's Paul really saying there. No two translations probably agree on what he's saying. You had to know, have a little fear. We're going to be talking about the literary nature. And you'll see why all this is important later on. Just trust me that you'll see why it's important to know some of these things. But he's using all different types of literary devices. These chapters, 10, 11, 12, 13, last four chapters of 2 Corinthians are just packed full. They're loaded with various literary devices. And they all serve to make the passage race to a conclusion. I said a moment ago that it results sometimes in compressed thought. There's so much that Paul is trying to say, and he's trying to walk such a line of balance that it's difficult to express himself the way he wants to express himself. He succeeds, by the way, by the time we get through, we'll see how just absolutely uh, fantastically these, how, how he did succeed. It was in a very superb manner. He's a good writer, he's a good thinker, but of course, as he tells himself, more and better than that, he has the Holy Spirit upon his life and mind, and the Spirit of God gives him these, these things to say. And because the passage kind of, these chapters race to a conclusion, you know what I mean by race? You're, they go so fast because there's so much Paul wants to say that sometimes along the way, you almost feel like either you're lost or Paul's lost or both. Something has been left out. Broken syntax, 2 Corinthians 13, 2 is one good example. Sometimes it's a little difficult to follow. Let me just pick out a few verses here. Take, for instance, just about any of these. I trust that some of you, anyway, are familiar with this. Maybe we won't even have to do 1 and 2 Corinthians and New Testament introduction in the mornings, Sunday mornings, because we will have done it here probably by the time we're through. We'll have to see. We do it well enough, we'll just say on one of those tapes, refer to the Paul's Thorn series for New Testament intro. But like in chapter 11, verses 19 and 20, for ye suffer fools gladly, seeing ye yourselves are wise. For ye suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man slap you on the face. You know, what, what are passages like that saying? Or right here in our own chapter, chapter 12. You ought to just have that seventh verse just about memorized. Because you're going to hear that a lot in this study, and you're going to hear it a lot from non-charismatic opponents to divine healing. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. You know, those aren't um, Philippians 4.19 type verses that you memorize, are they? Though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. Very difficult verses here. And look down in verses uh, uh, 17 and following. Did I make a gain of you by any of them whom I sent unto you? I desired Titus, and with him I sent a brother. Did Titus make a gain of you? Walked we not in the same spirit? Walked we not in the same steps? Again, think ye that we excuse ourselves unto you. We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things, dearly beloved, for your edifying. Just verse after verse after verse has, you know, very little meaning, I would say, to the average Christian and to the average Bible reader because these uh, chapters are unique. And somewhat of that is true, I guess, with all of 2 Corinthians. It just doesn't read like 1 Corinthians, where uh, the verses are rather clear and easy to understand, and you read them, and you pick up a meaning, or at least you have a feel for a meaning. On some of these verses, you don't even get a feel. You just don't know what he's talking about. Talking about people taking them in bondage and slapping them in the face. What you really have here in these four chapters is the Apostle Paul under a withering, slanderous assault 
by his opponents at Corinth. And he is forced to launch into a devastating counterattack against them and the gullible, vacillating Corinthian church. And here we see several things about the Apostle Paul. We see how, for instance, in the first place, Paul exercises apostolic authority and leadership. We see how he handles accusations against him, how he deals with his critics, which is um, not, a, not a very pretty sight to see. I guess there's one thing that would come to my mind. It's in Galatians 5, a, a verse or a passage that is probably... Uh, the cruelest thing Paul could say. I, I think, no, I take that back. I was supposed to put that in my notes, and I never did. So I need to, I need to make a note of that and remember to put that somewhere because I finished my notes and never got it over there. But there's one in Galatians 5 that is just about the cruelest, lowest thing you could say to someone. And Paul says that not against any of the saints or believers, but against the wolves in sheep's clothing. And he does that here in 2 Corinthians 10 to 13, a blistering attack, counterattack. He's forced to launch this because of his critics and the accusations made against him. And not because he's so much wounded personally, but because the faith of the Corinthian church is on the line. The gospel is at stake here. Paul could endure uh, some slander from people that uh, couldn't do anything with their slander. But if their slander could somehow affect the faith of the Corinthian church, uh, then Paul wasn't going to allow that, not for a moment. We see how he handles his enemies. We see how he handles a compromising church, the Corinthians, a group of people who many of them are carnal, if not most of them are carnal, and they are listening to some false leaders which are uh, in their midst now. They've come into the midst of the Corinthians after Paul has left from an earlier visit. And they are accusing Paul. We're going to give you a list of the accusations. And you've got to read 2 Corinthians with discernment. And although Paul doesn't give you a list, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, now here are the five accusations, you can tell simply by what he's responding to. When he's devoting a chapter or half a chapter to a certain topic and he's defending himself, then you can put two and two together and say, well, this must be one of the accusations that his opponents are leveling against him. And the Corinthian church is weak. They are compromising. They're vacillating. They're tempted to receive what these newly arisen teachers, these wolves in sheep's clothing, are saying about Paul, and Paul's not there. We'll see where he is here in a moment. But he writes letters back to try to correct them and to uh, really make mockery and ridicule because he turns the tables and turns the arguments and accusations on these false apostles, as he calls them back in chapter 11, ministers, messengers of Christ, or of Satan, rather. So I, I just think it's really important that you understand what the nature of the content of these chapters is if we want to properly identify the thorn. We must understand what's going on here. The very people who uh, tell us now this is what the thorn is, why, they're the ones who are always telling us, now, don't take something out of context. Study it in its context. Don't try to use Moses and his um, good eyesight at, the hundred, at 120. What does that have to do with you? Or don't try to use Caleb's strength at 85. That was Caleb, and, and, and that's Caleb, and, and I'm me, and you are you, and, well, Paul was Paul. Don't try to steal his thorn from him then. Really inconsistent people. But they, they tell us, look at the context on things where they don't like the way we're interpreting a passage. And then whenever we don't like the way they are interpreting a passage and say, look at the context, they don't. Here are some of the things Paul does. We see here in these chapters, he loves, he expresses his love. Chapter 11, chapter 11 and verse 2, I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. In verse 11, wherefore? Because I love you not, God knoweth. In other words, of course not. The reason I'm doing whatever verse 10 is talking about, is that because I don't love you? No, on the contrary, it's because I do love you. So he loves, he explains chapter 12 and verse 10. We don't need to read that now. That'll be part of our answer later on. He threatens chapter 13 and verse 2. 
You see, whenever you're a minister of Christ, and he calls himself that in verse 23 of chapter 11, he asks, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more. He doesn't mean I'm more than they are. They are, at least are somewhat ministers of Christ. No, that's not what he means there. He means they are, and I am. And whenever you are a minister of Christ, you have to, you're, there are all different types of situations that arise. And Paul has to have as a minister of Christ, and especially as Jesus' apostle, these weapons at his disposal. He talks about those weapons back in chapter 10, uh, verses 3 to 5, the spiritual weapons, and not, not the fleshly or carnal ones, but spiritual ones. So he threatens in chapter 13 and verse 2, I told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time and being absent, now I write to them which heretofore have sinned and to all other that if I come again, I will not spare. Now that is an apostolic threat there. I've written to you before. I've written to you. This is the second time I've come to you before. He's come to them on more than one occasion. If I have to come again, I will not spare. He threatens them. He's threatening the whole Corinthian church there. As an apostle, he can do that. So he threatens. He rebukes chapter 12. In verse 11, I am become a fool in glorying, and you are the ones who have compelled me to do it. It's your fault. He rebukes them. It's your fault that I had to do what I just did, tell about my vision, my thorn. See, he didn't want to tell about that. That's a private matter between him and God. He did not want to tell about that. He said, you Corinthians, the fact that you're listening to the accusations made by the false apostles, you forced my hand. You forced me to do it, and I didn't want to, and you made me to be a fool. For I ought to have been commended of you. In other words, you know, you should have uh, taken up my stand and defended me before those false apostles rather than listening to them and then have to have me write to you for you to rebuke them and me to rebuke you. I am become a fool in glory. You compel me. For I ought to have been commended of you. For in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. <clears throat> So he rebukes, he practices irony, verse 15 of the same chapter. And of course, you could find many other verses that fit under each one of these categories. He practices irony, verse 15. I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Or maybe even worse than that, this is a lower blow to the Corinthians, chapter 11 and verse 19, for seeing that you suffer fools gladly that's because you yourselves are wise you suffer fools gladly saying ye yourselves are wise but then of course verse 20 <laughs> he's showing that it's sarcasm and irony here that he's practicing on them because he said if you're so wise why is it that you allow a man to bring you into bondage to devour you to take you to exalt himself and to hit you in the face you're so smart. And I guess that'd be a good verse for sarcasm, I guess, 1120. He practices sarcasm with the Corinthians. And maybe most importantly, through it all, we see how he deals with the very delicate situation of personal boasting. That happens to be the predominant theme in chapters 10 through 13, boasting. You find the word in the Greek several different times. Sometimes it's boasting. Sometimes it might be translated glorying or glory or exalt. But that seems to be the chief theme through these last four chapters where he is noting his own accomplishments and his experiences. It's the central theme of these chapters. Let me give you a few verses to support that. Uh, chapter 11 and verse 10. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia, which is southern Greece. And verses 16 through 21, I say again, let no man think me a fool. If otherwise, yet as a fool, receive me that I may boast myself a little. That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly in this confidence of boasting. 
And he goes on, verse 21, I speak as concerning reproach as though we had been weak, howbeit wherein soever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. It means boast there. You got all different types of words in the KJV and other translations that uh, are simply to be placed under this theme of boasting. Take verse 21 as a difficult verse to interpret. I speak as concerning reproach as though we had been weak, howbeit wherein soever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Lots of parentheses you find in these chapters also. Generally, there's something about I speak as a fool, which is what this one is, I speak as a fool. Or in verse 23, I think you find it again, I speak as a fool. Then in chapter 12 and verse 1, I hope you're following along. It's not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. Well, to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. In chapter 11, which we read earlier, talking about glorying. And then back in chapter 10, verses 12 uh, to the end of the chapter, 18. Chapter 10, verses 12 to 18. The whole thing is about boasting. His boasting versus the boasting of the false apostles. Now, in all of this, keep in mind that the most popular denominational response to Paul's thorn is that God made him sick to keep him humble. And we're going to say that there's simply no way that that interpretation will ever fit in this setting. All right, in the second place in tonight, let's come to the background of Paul's relationship with the Corinthians. That was a little bit on the nature of these four chapters. The background of Paul's relationship with the Corinthians. When I say that these four chapters are filled with literary devices that are unusual, sometimes awkward, sometimes difficult to interpret. So fast here in these chapters. But be that as it may, let's in the second place come to the background of Paul's relationship with the Corinthians. And I think that it's equally as important to grasp, at least in an outline fashion, uh, some of the dealings that he has with the Corinthians, how the church there was founded, what his relationship to them is. You're, gonna, you're not even going to be able to see, I don't think, tonight. It's going to come in retrospect the importance of what we're saying tonight whenever we get to really identifying the thorn or whenever we get to um, identifying what the thorn was not, then you'll say, yeah, I remember now about what 2 Corinthians is all about and Paul's experiences and Paul's travels and Paul's relationship and Paul's mind and his heart, his spirit, his personality and the nature of the content of chapter 12 in 2 Corinthians and all four of those chapters as a matter of fact. You'll be able to think back on that and say, now I understand how that relates to what we're saying and what we're studying now. So under this, I've got several headings. In the first place, we will look at the pre-literary relationship. That means before Paul ever began writing letters to the Corinthians. The pre-literary relationship that Paul had with the Corinthians. This in your Bible actually goes back to the book of Acts, the 18th chapter. Acts chapter 18, the first 17 verses. Paul comes into contact with the Corinthian people on his second journey. It was begun back in the end of chapter 15 in Acts when Paul and Barnabas had that dissension between the two of them and they split company, Paul taking Silas with him and Barnabas taking John Mark with him. And they go on a trip and visit some of the places they've been earlier and they go elsewhere as well. And in chapter 18 and verse 1, Paul is in Greece. He's just passed through Athens. That was most of uh, chapter 17. And he finally arrives at Corinth. Now, this is the first time he's ever been at Corinth. 
He moves into the home of Aquila and Priscilla in verse 2 and begins to practice the same trade that they do to make a living, verse 3. He's alone. He doesn't have the other men who travel with him in his ministry uh, at this time. They're back in Athens. Or really, no, they're not in Athens. They're back uh, trying to deal with those Thessalonians and Bereans where they have escaped earlier. And then they went through Athens from Macedonia and came on down to Corinth. But Paul is arriving, uh, he's, he's new on the scene, he doesn't have anyone else around him. And so, you know, what would you picture an apostle to do? What would the apostle Paul do? Well, he's got to make a living, he doesn't have any church that he's pastoring there, so he's got to make a living, got to live somewhere, got to find something to do. So the first thing he does, he locates some people, Priscilla and Aquila, he moves into them, verse 2, moves in with them, verse 2, into their home, practicing the same trade. Verse 3. For by their occupation, they were tent makers. On the side, the Apostle Paul begins to preach the gospel in the local Jewish synagogue, the Corinthian Jewish synagogue, verse 4. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. That last word probably refers to the god fears. In verse 5, a few of his traveling companions, Silas and Timothy by name, finally catch up with him. And they are probably bringing a gift, a financial gift, from the Macedonian churches. Now that's based on some information elsewhere in the New Testament. And somewhat based on verses 5 and 6 right here in Acts 18. They evidently bring a financial gift from the Macedonian church. They've been up there in the beginning of chapter 17. Well, what do you think a financial gift will do for Paul? Well, that freed Paul to devote himself full-time to preaching. He was making a living with his hands while he had to. But if he doesn't have to do that all the time, he's not going to. If he can spend more time preaching, that's what he'll do. Because in verses 5 and 6, we see that Paul not only surrenders that Jewish ministry, he shakes the blood of their hands off uh, his hands, the blood of their head off his hands, and he goes and starts preaching to the Gentiles. Well, more ministry brings more opposition. He has to leave the synagogue. He moves his operations. Lo and behold, right next door, verse 7. Wasn't a very far move at all. He moved it right next door into the house of a man named Justice. What a good name he had. He was a God-fearer. He worshipped God. We know that from the Greek that he was a God-fearer, a Gentile who believed what the Jews were saying, but uh, maybe didn't go for all that legalism. As a result, in verse 8, Crispus, the chief ruler of that synagogue, he had just left for some reason... It took Paul leaving before Crispus finally sees the light. Crispus is converted along with his whole house. And many of the other Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized, verse 8. Now, before I get into verse 9, I have to backtrack a little bit and tell you of some of the other things that have happened in chapters 16 and 17. Paul had received some terrible persecution back in those chapters at Philippi in chapter 16, he had received severe beatings at the hands of the Romans. And in Berea in chapter 17, he barely escaped with his life. He left the Thessalonians because, remember, an, an uproar was, was caused there. He goes down to the Bereans. They're more noble. They receive the word of God and search the scriptures daily if these things be so. Then when Jews at Thessalonica heard that the Bereans were receiving the word of God, they came down and tried to stir up some trouble. And so Paul's companions, verse 14, sent him off to try to get him out of there and save his life, and he barely escapes with his life. And now at Corinth, in verse 6, he's experiencing persecution again. Now, all of this, chapter 16, 17, 18 now, I mean, you can hardly find any episode in Paul's life where he's not being beaten or stoned or threatened or shipwrecked. Paul may have been a little uncertain as to what to do next. I wouldn't say that he 
fell into fear or doubt or discouragement like the commentators say, I would just say that Paul may have been a little uncertain as to what to do next. He lost his Jewish outreach here in Corinth. The Gentile outreach seems to be going okay, but he's not preaching in the synagogue anymore. They won't have him there. So what does he do next? Well, I would just suggest that he's probably a little uncertain as to what to do. And so the Lord Jesus himself appears to Paul, verses 9 and 10, to strengthen him with a word about election and predestination. This is verses 9 and 10. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. Well, Paul would have reason to, <laughs> to think otherwise from all these chapters here. And, and Jesus didn't appear to him earlier like in Philippi and say, no man will hurt thee. I guess if he would have appeared and said that, he wouldn't have gotten beaten there. And if you read the rest of chapter 18, you see Paul never experiences any more beatings here. The only people that get beaten here are the Jews, the ruler of the synagogue who takes over after Crispus is converted, Sosthenes. He gets beaten. He's the only one that's getting beaten. Paul doesn't get beaten anymore. So the Lord gave him a word of wisdom here. I'm with you. Don't be afraid. Go ahead and speak. Don't hold your peace. You don't need to be uncertain. You know, Paul's thinking, what should I do? Should I move on to the next city? Paul has to have some revelation as to how long I should stay here. He doesn't just know automatically. He goes as the Spirit of the Lord leads him. Should I go here? Shouldn't I? Sometimes the Spirit suffered him not. Chapter 16, to go into a certain area. Uh, sometimes he'd get by revelation uh, that he would go into an area, like the man from Macedonia in chapter 16 saying, come over and help us. Paul saw him in a vision and went over. Paul doesn't know what to do, where to go next. So the Lord appears to him and strengthens him, I said, with a word of election. Because look at the end of verse 10. For I have much people in this city. Well, God doesn't have any people there. They're all pagans, except the few that Paul has been able to convert thus far. And certainly God's not talking about them because they're not many. They're not much people. And Paul would already know about them. And they're not giving him the encouragement that he needs. What God is talking about here is that I have many people here who are called to salvation, who are elect. And they just haven't heard the gospel yet. You just haven't met them and they haven't met you yet. You can be in a place where God can show you that I have, my people are here. Now, when he says my people, they may be the children of the devil. They are at the time he's saying that. But election means that they are elect and God's going to bring them in. In other words, what God is saying, no, Paul, don't go somewhere else. There's a huge field white unto harvest here at Corinth. You haven't met them yet. That's the problem. You've only met a few of them. But there's a huge field, white for harvest here. I have much people in this city. It's just either you haven't met them, they haven't met you, or their day hasn't come. And so proof of that is the next verse. Paul went ahead and stayed there 18 months, a year and a half, teaching the word of God among them. He knew from the word that the Lord gave him just to stay there and stay faithful. God had people. God had his people there that he sent Paul at two Corinth in the first place to preach the message to. And it was just a matter of time before the two of them got together. So he's encouraged. He ends up staying one and a half years. He evidently sees many more conversions, including evidently the new replacement ruler in the Jewish synagogue, Sosthenes, because he's found over in 1 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. Now, after this period closed which was the spring of A.D. 52. No commentators really have any problem with that. After this period closed, he left Corinth for Ephesus, verses 18 and 19. At Ephesus, he leaves his former hosts, Priscilla and Aquila. They travel with him from Corinth to Ephesus. They remain at Ephesus. He leaves them there. He sails on to Jerusalem. Uh, verse 21, verse 22. He sails on to, he lands at uh, Caesarea, goes up to the church at Jerusalem. 
And then finally he returns to Antioch. Now this is second so-called missionary journey. He wants to go to Jerusalem, verse 22, to, if by any means, keep the feast, either Passover or Pentecost, one or the other. When he had landed at Caesarea, verse 22, and had gone up and saluted the church, that means the one at Jerusalem, then he went to his home base, his home church, which was one in Antioch. Okay, now let's do a little bit more before we get into uh, our, our next point of study. He remains here in Antioch evidently for just a matter of days or weeks after a very brief visit with the church at Antioch. He takes off on his third journey, arriving back at Ephesus. Where Aquila and Priscilla had stayed earlier, probably in the fall of the same year, A.D. 52. This is according to Acts 19.1. So I'm not going to draw this up here because I'll get my map all messed up and I need it for other times, but let's just have him at... He's at um, Corinth. He, he founds the church there back in chapter 18, second journey. First, his first journey uh, went something like this. He went up over to the island of Cyprus. He went up to Perga and Pamphylia. He went up to Antioch. Then he went to Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. Then he goes back from Derbe, Lystra, Iconium, down to Perga and Pamphylia. And then he sails back to Jerusalem. That was the first journey. The second one, we don't need to give you all the beginning of it, but he goes from the end of it, from Corinth to Ephesus, he drops off Aquila and Priscilla there. He sails down to Caesarea, visits the disciples there, goes to Jerusalem, salutes the church, goes back to Antioch, end of the second journey. Third journey he takes off, and where he wants to get evidently is the city of Ephesus. All he had been able to do is just touch on it at the end of the second journey. And he must have had some revelation from God that this was going to be a very fruitful area, and he wanted to get back there as soon as possible. So the same year, the fall of A.D. 52, he goes back to Ephesus, and he remains there for a period of between two and a half and three years, longest stay anywhere in Paul's ministry that we have record of. He stayed longer in the city of Ephesus than anywhere else. Now, that's going to become important because it was during his stay at Ephesus that his correspondence with the Corinthian church begins, which is why we're studying that because it'll bring up bring us up to his Corinthian correspondence although right now we're looking at pre-literary relationship I said that he stays here for a period of between two and a half and three years that's according to Acts 1910 and Acts 2031 he has a very, very fruitful time. He's able to speak in the synagogue. This is generally his pattern, only for a brief period of time. Verses 8 and 9a. He's eventually put out of the synagogue, no problem. He evidently takes over during the noon hours the hall of a Greek teacher whose name is Tyrannus, and he speaks there daily. Now, one of the texts, I think it's the... Um, uh, which text is that? Bezen text? It doesn't make any difference, but one of the texts gives a, a time period here that Paul took over the hall or the school of Tyrannus during what was traditionally then a recess period anyway from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. That's five hours. And uh, we're told here, I don't know if we're supposed to take this literally or not, but he disputed daily in the school of Tyrannus. Now, if we're to take that literally, and if that uh, other text is right, giving us the time from 11 until 4 or 5 hours, 5 hours a day, 7 days a week, uh, next verse, and this continued by the space of 2 years, for 2 years, then you could see why the end of verse 10 would be true. So everyone in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus. You're teaching five hours a day, and what he's preaching on is the gospel of the kingdom, the kingdom of God. Can you imagine someone having enough to say five hours a day, seven days a week for two solid years? Now, don't quote me on that five hours a day, but we know Paul was a long speaker, though. 
the uh, next chapter will prove that, 20. He talked all night there. So let's say he spoke two hours. You know, so what? Still, that's quite an impressive feat there. Two hours a day, five, six, seven days a week, two years plus. Two years here, and you've got three years over in uh, chapter 20. So it's over two years. And, you know, Ephesus is a huge city, a, a very important, significant city here with a very famous temple devoted to the goddess Artemis. And so people from all over Asia on various occasions would be coming to the city of Ephesus, you know, to do business or to visit or to whatever. And it would be easy to get around uh, this, this rumor that you should hear this Palestinian Christian rabbi down here at Tyrannus School. Man, he's been, he's been at that five hours a day for what, what's it been now? Um, Hulda, it's been 18 months he's been there now. You ought to hear him. You know, anyone who probably comes into the town is going to go hear what Paul has to say. Because Luke does tell us, the end of verse 10, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. I don't know that all has to mean every single individual, but all means a large number of people. All throughout Asia, Jews and Greeks came here and heard Paul lecture. I can picture him lecturing. Five hours a day, seven days a week for two and a half to three years. Never run out of material. Well, let's, let's go on then. That leaves us with Paul's letters and visits to Corinth after the church has been established. So we move into a second point here. That was all pre-literary relationship, pre-literary relationship, from here on out, letters and visits. Paul's letters and visits to Corinth. First visit doesn't count. That's just establishing the church. He's in Ephesus now in 19. Acts 19. So the second thing we'll be discussing is letters and visits. Now I've got several points under this to keep everything organized. First of all, we will speak of Corinthian A. Corinthian A. At some point during Paul's Ephesian stay and ministry, he wrote a letter to the Corinthians, which is now lost. We know of its existence from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 11. If you'll turn over there. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 11. We know of the existence of Corinthian A, which is lost to us today. It wasn't lost to the Corinthians. They had it. They read it. They misunderstood it. That's why we get a Corinthian B. But we don't have it today. Paul says in verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 5, I wrote unto you in an epistle. Well, now, wait a minute. We're reading 1 Corinthians. You mean there was something earlier than 1 Corinthians? Yes, there was a first 1 Corinthians or we'll call it Corinthian A. We'll have an A, B, C, and D rather than a pre-first, first, between first and second and second. That becomes rather difficult to follow. I wrote unto you in an epistle. Its content was basically this. He warned the Corinthian Christians not to have fellowship with fornicators. Now, that's what verse 9 says the epistle was about. If it, if it included anything else in addition to that, then we're ignorant of it. It'd be um, pure speculation to say you know what else that first letter to the Corinthians had to say. Corinthian A, we know, evidently the gist of it was he warned the Corinthian Christians not to have fellowship with fornicators. How detailed or how explicit he was about that, how long the letter was, uh, how uh, severe the warning was, we have no way of knowing. But for whatever the reason, the Corinthians didn't fully understand what he meant. Maybe he didn't say enough. Maybe it was a very, very brief letter, like a you know book of Philemon or something. We don't know. But for whatever reason, the Corinthians misunderstood what Paul's first letter said, Corinthian 8. They end up with a misconception in their mind. All right, then that brings us to Corinthian B. Their misunderstanding of Corinthian A was at least one reason for the writing of Corinthian B. 
which is our 1 Corinthians. This is our 1 Corinthians. Now, I want to give you three points underneath this, Corinthian B. In the first place, the misunderstanding over Corinthian A had somehow found its way back to Paul. That's one reason for the writing of Corinthian B. Not the only one, but it's one. Certainly the reason for chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians. But this misunderstanding that the Corinthians had found its way back to Paul, who then wrote our 1 Corinthians, especially chapter 5, as a corrective. He clarifies himself, which would lead some to believe that he wasn't that clear in Corinthian A, but he clarifies himself in telling the Corinthians, my recommendation uh, of disassociation from sinners concerned only those who profess to be brothers. Paul had written them and said, don't company with fornicators. Maybe that's all he said. So the Corinthians read that in Corinthian A and say, hmm, well, my employer is a fornicator or my two of my employees are fornicators um, or my unsaved wife or husband's a fornicator or my next door neighbor is a fornicator or hmm well everyone I know is a fornicator in Corinth so I guess that must mean that we just got to pretty much uh, live a monastic life so Paul writes back and said no that's not what I either said or meant we don't know which but we know it was certainly at least meant that's not what I meant Verse 10, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or you'd have to go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother. Now that's the key. That's the corrective there. His recommendation of disassociation from sinners. And he expands that list from fornicators in verse 9 to covetous, idolaters, railers, drunkards, extortioners, and we could add some other things onto the list. He just means people that are practicing some obvious, uh, known, blatant form of sin. But he's not talking about sinners outside of the church. He's talking about those who are in the church. So to correct this misunderstanding, he writes Corinthian B. But in the second place, he has some other reasons for writing as well. A second one was the report brought to him by people from the house of Chloe, C-L-O-E, C-H-L-O-E, from the house of Chloe, about factions within the body. Chapter 1 and verse 11. I fear... But this is a little heavy for maybe some of you. I know it's a lot of material. This is another reason why he's writing Corinthian B, which is our first Corinthians. First of all, to correct the misunderstanding of Corinthian A. And now secondly, because a report has come back to him from members of the household of Chloe that there are factions caused by party spirits developing at the Corinthian church. Look at verse 11 of chapter 1. It hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. So this, this factualism had led to strife and party spirits and pride to the point they were choosing up sides, taking each other to court, suing one another, while allowing gross immorality to be, to be tolerated, as we find here in the first six chapters. All of these chapters are about, like the first four, about all the factions that they have, and the party spirits. They've been choosing up sides. Well, if you choose up sides, then that's going to lead to lawsuits against one another, which it does in chapter 6, and they're suing one another in secular courts. In the meantime, they're tolerating gross immorality fornication as is not even named among the gentiles that one should have his father's wife first corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1 so this is the miserable situation that the corinthians are in at this time and paul is writing first corinthians corinthian b to rectify attempt to anyway some of those problems then thirdly there's another reason why he's writing 
Evidently, the church at Corinth had sent Paul a letter by the hands of three men. Maybe these are ones of the household of Chloe who also brought this verbal report. But be that as it may, these men bring a written report to Paul asking him a series of questions. These three men are named. Their names are Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus. Those are the men who bring the letter that is one of the reasons that necessitates the penning of 1 Corinthians. So I guess that's kind of just important to know in itself. Why did Paul write Corinthians? Well, three men came to him, Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus. Bring him a letter asking him a series of questions. Their names are found in the last chapter in the 17th verse, 1 Corinthians 16, 17. They ask him a series of questions, and evidently Paul begins dealing with them starting with chapter 7 and verse 1. Chapter 7 and verse 1, look at this. Now concerning the things whereof he wrote unto me. Well, now, first six chapters, Paul said, I have heard from you, members of the household of glory, certain factions that are developing there. I've heard that. That's a report by word of mouth. Now he's got another report, and it's a report by the written word now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me and from chapter 7 through chapter 16 he proceeds to respond to those questions they concerned marriage they concerned divorce they concerned virginity they concern weak brothers meat offered to idols they concern the head covering they concern communion and the Lord's Supper, the love feast. They concern spiritual gifts. They concern women speaking in the church. They concern the doctrine of the resurrection. Uh, and what's the last one? Chapter 16, 1. They concern taking up money, collection, the offering that was going to be taken up for the church down in Jerusalem that had experienced a famine as Agabus, the prophet, had prophesied and predicted back in Acts chapter 11. So it's a whole lot of things that you find here in Corinthian B. Now, that may be more or less well known to you. What we're going to get into now may not be that well known. The third thing we'll discuss under letters and visits is often referred to as the, quote, painful visit, unquote. The painful visit. So the first thing has been Corinthian A, a letter now lost to us that he wrote about fornication in. The second thing is Corinthian B, which is our first Corinthians. And I just gave you three reasons why he wrote that. The third thing, the third time where we see some relationship between Paul and the Corinthians is what is often called the, quote, painful visit, unquote, the painful visit. Now, just bear with me, please. Uh, I, I'm already combining two messages, it looks like, so we're saving ourselves some time in the future. Write down whatever you can because it becomes a little complex. Whenever Paul sent 1 Corinthians off, he evidently sent it off by the same three men that brought a letter to him. Remember, Paul's over here in Ephesus. This message will be continued.